Welcome back to the Change Truth Podcast. My name is Carl, and on this podcast, I'm speaking to people about drugs, addiction, and mental health. On this episode, I'm speaking with Stephen Dunbar Edge. Stephen is the executive director of the Whitehorse Food Bank, and he has been for the last five years or so. He grew up in the Yukon, but has also traveled throughout all of northern Canada, as he will explain. And Stephen and I, we talk about his perspective on these issues of drugs, addiction, mental health, specifically as it relates to the people he works with at the food bank. So check it out. This is me with Stephen Dunbar-Edge. As I've been uh, executive director of the Whitehorse Food Bank for about five years, we've served a great number of people. On average, we are serving close to 700 clients a month, which translates to just about 1,500 people when you look at the uh, families that extend Uh, beyond the client base. Um, We have grown, unfortunately, uh, over the past four to five years by about three times. Unfortunately? Unfortunately, yes. Who wants a food bank to grow, right? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. if if the demand for food outweighs my my money coming in, it's <laughs> right. it's been a struggle. So every year, uh, not only do I have to meet the growth in demand, but I also have to try to find the funding, uh, the money to support that growth that happens. Um, since the food bank opened, we're serving about three and a half times the number of people that they had predicted uh, to begin with. Now, the food bank itself is not funded by government. We rely 100% on corporate and individual donations to oh. be able to operate monthly. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, there's uh, only two paid staff. Uh, there's myself and I have a operations manager. Um, I only got the operations manager about a year and a half ago. So before then, it was just myself. Um, The organization succeeds based on the fact that we have a very strong volunteer base. Yeah, you must. I have have 55 to 65 regular volunteers a month that contribute well over 700 hours to make this place work. Um, And that doesn't even include the people who contribute time during big food drives, who run their own office food drives, who may have some sort of event. That's not taken into account. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're sir, you said like maybe 1500 people, including families. Mm. And I mean, with a population of white horses is only like 25. That's a pretty big percentage of the population. It utilizing these really services. is. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> just recently, I did tabulate too that in 2014, 11% of my client base came from the communities outside of Whitehorse. Uh, um, but that's still, you know, still, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to populations. remember these are people, they're small populations, plus they're people who don't get into town all the time. I will often find, for example, I'll have families come in from, say, a place like Pelly, as yeah. far as Pelly, but that's because maybe grandma has a medical appointment. So right. they, they all get in the car. So you might even have two or three families taking advantage of the fact that a vehicle is coming into town and they can get some groceries. Right. Yeah. Um, and so often what they'll do is, is sometimes come to see the food bank as well. Right. And so with... I mean, you obviously, we, we talked a little bit before and you said that you don't obviously, you don't take in a questionnaire, you're not asking people if they're on drugs or whatever, but you, you sort of, that is a large portion of the population that you are dealing with. People who, who are battling mental health issues or drug addiction type of issues. Sure. A combination of both. Um, we do have people uh, with mental health issues. Um, we see on a regular basis. We know we have people that um, have addictions because uh, addictions can often be a telltale sign based on their behavior. And so sometimes we'll see behavior that we know is conducive to either alcohol or drug addiction. Um, and so we deal with that. And we try to uh, sort of deal with it on different levels. You have people who are who you could say functional, who maybe have a family um, and are coming in to get food, you know that they have problems. Well, whether or not they have done wrong or spent their money inappropriately, et cetera, is really kind of an irrelevant point to the fact that there's still other family members who need to eat. Right. And so we have sort of a a non-judgment environment about that. We don't ask about those things as to what may be going on in their life that is causing them to be here. Mm. But we do know that based on certain employment, uh, you know, like whether they're employed or not employed, if they're on disability, if 
they're on social assistance. We do ask those sorts of questions. What oh, is their okay. source of income? What is their um, uh, what is their type of housing? Are they in social housing? Are they in private rentals? Do right. they own their own home? Are they on the street? Those are the types of questions we ask. Do you have any people that are actually on the street? Yes. That don't have? Yes. Oh, wow. No fixed address. NFA. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, we do have a number of people that fall into that category that are either couch surfing or oh, yeah. uh, spending their time at the shelter. We try to deal with those clients a little bit differently. I, I've developed a bit of a personal philosophy that um, although uh, society may view the choices they make uh, without favor, um, the reality is that in our society, if they collapse on the street, if they fall asleep in the street, if they get sick with alcohol poisoning, or if they do drug overdoses, we take care of them in our hospitals. Well, if they haven't got anything to eat, the chances are much higher that they will end up in that ditch, end up dehydrated, end up in the hospital. That costs sure. society $3,000. I have a pretty quick fix for that be it a can of sardines and <laughs> our oysters and some crackers that may keep them from going over the edge that uh, ends up being. So I can spend $3.90 to give them something to eat, or we can spend $3,000 to deal with it right. uh, in the hospital. So sure. um, from a business perspective, because I have a, a, a business background, uh, there is doesn't make a lot of sense from a business case perspective. Uh, I do wish, though, that someone would um, pay for that for me. <laughs> that would be yeah. great. But we are looking at running a specific program to deal with people who are on the street where um, they might come to us. Because, for example, if someone comes to us for food, usually we only give them about three days worth of food once a calendar month. So it's really okay. emergency food we're talking about. Uh, but to someone who's on the street, they don't really have anywhere to put three days worth of food. Uh, yeah. So I want to move to a system where with those people, I say, look, instead of getting a hamper once a month, if you come in on non-distribution days, I might give you, say, 10 day packs in a month. Mm. So on days that you find you can't go into the Salvation Army, who doesn't allow people who are intoxicated to be in there, right. I could give them a day pack, which at least gives them food for that day. Um, so we're considering shifting to that sort of model for those people specifically. One of the beautiful things about what we've done here at the food bank over the last five years is we've really tracked a lot. I, I've really been good at recording a lot of data. So I really understand now who comes to see us and the differences between them. In terms of what you mentioned before, where they're living. and Right. Absolutely. The demographics. We understand the demographics. For example, one thing I can say with full confidence that my biggest growth client are clients who are actually employed, but are in private rentals. They're paying so much in rent that they can't afford food. Really? So that has been my highest growth area. People who are employed, but don't make enough money to cover the very high rents here in Whitehorse. Yeah, the rents are high up here. They really are. <laughs> and um, so you have a high rent, but not necessarily a high wage to match that. Um, so we'll see those families in here. And those, and those have been necessarily growing. necessarily people with addiction or mental health at mm, all it's not just, necessarily this is pure i need to live right yeah financial yeah absolutely um and then when when you talk about people when it comes to like a, a, an addictions issue there's nothing within my demographics that would point to them because i think addictions really cover all demographics male female age i don't yeah. think there's a specific demographic that speaks to addictions however um what you, what I think that we could say is that based on the behaviors of some people who come in here at certain times, we know that that is an issue um, with right. some families. Right. But we then I'll it. go to, yeah, we see it. We see it. You know, we have a sign at the front that says, you know, if you're intoxicated, you may not be served today. Um, usually I make that call based on their behavior. 
Yeah. If they're getting by and not causing any trouble and moving through, it's just easier to serve them and move them through sure. versus having uh, some sort scene. of conflict or confrontation. Right. Uh, however, if their behavior is disruptive to the volunteers or the other clients who are here, yes, we do address that and ask them to come back. I'm pretty proud to say that I've never banned anybody here from the food bank. Right. Uh, I've never done that based on any behavior and i mean we've had some fights break out here we've had yeah, okay. certain things that yeah, have happened yeah yeah we do see conflict sometimes because many times people um who are uh, um in the system know other people in the system there may be family conflicts there may be uh, right. all kinds of things that you just don't know um <clears throat> but what i do know is that I won't judge anybody based on that snapshot, that moment in time where they've made bad decisions. Uh, because if the next time they come and we can have a decent conversation and their behavior is changed, well, then they're doing what I, I need them to do to be right. here at the food bank. So That's I've never cool. banned anybody from the food bank. We have asked them to leave at that moment in time. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and then when you start talking about um, uh, alcohol, that's one thing. H having grown up in the North, I've seen that a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we know we have the highest alcohol consumption rates than anywhere else in Canada yeah, that's per right. capita. Um, it cannot be argued. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and I've lived in Nunavut and I've lived in, 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 um, uh, Northwest territories. And so I've really seen it all. I've been in communities that are considered controlled communities, dry right, those, communities, right. right? I just watched a little mm -hmm. documentary about those in, in Nunavut. Yeah, that's right. And they have, the booze is still coming into those communities too. It's just that it costs $500 for a bottle of vodka instead of $60. <laughs> Bootlegging is definitely, um, uh, uh, uh yeah. you know, an industry. There, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I will say, though, that uh, in in some of these communities where they have it as a dry community, it's amazing the number of people who actually really like that. And um, it probably, I'm it's sure voted it in. down on it a little bit. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, you might have it underground, but people, people who, especially if they're part of that community, not outside of the community, what I mean specifically by that is you get a place like Coral Harbor, and if you're non-Inuit, well, you're less than 5% of the population. Right. Um, and, you know, you may say, well, I'm going to smuggle some booze in and keep it really hidden in my house. Um, that would be fine. You certainly wouldn't be flaunting the fact that you might have alcohol in your house yeah uh and that goes for the within the community people who are from there too is that they know that it's it's not accepted in their community and so i don't think they're very brazen about it i do find that the community itself will deal with people within their own communities that are doing that and some of them are better at it than others right and some of those My communities own, are pretty small absolutely well. so they're, very they're quite small tight yeah, you know. very tight, very, everyone knows everyone, maybe mm. even related in some way through marriage or, or, or family. Yeah. Um, and it's important too, to keep in mind that uh, what I saw when I, for example, when I lived in Northwest Territories in Nunavut, and I've been to all the communities in the North, by the way, there are 96 of them in case you were curious. <laughs> and some of them I've been to more than once. Wow. Um, the communities that I found that were the healthiest communities where people were smiling as they walked down the street, where they had a sense of community, where they were building co-ops, there was often community feasts, all of those sorts of things. The healthiest communities were the communities where we, as European descendant people, had had the least influence. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Yeah, like wherever there were communities where there had been a mine beside them or a, a, a defense department, mm. uh, like a, a, a some sort of base by their um, thing tend to be uh, communities that were less healthy, huh. um, where we had made so much disruption within the culture and the lifestyles there sure. that um, there was um, generational uh, gaps in, in information and in knowledge, in, yeah, right, uh, right. in pride of yourself, in your community. Um, yeah, and I think that is a big part of addiction. And like, to put it frankly, like, it's clear in this part of Canada, the, the native population does have a very high addiction rate and, and alcoholism rate. And I, I personally think that it is because that their culture, their community has been so disrupted. And I think that is the cause of addiction is sort of a, a trauma or pain 
that you're trying to you have a void that you're trying to fill with something some outside thing that's my opinion and it it just makes sense when you think of the all the residential schooling that has gone on and all that. of course this population is going to have pain you know they're going to mm -hmm. have that pain to that they're trying to to heal somehow mm -hmm. with these uh, they're self medicating i think is is what mm -hmm. it comes down to with alcohol or whether it's heroin or or crack cocaine or or whatever it, it it comes up to be it's 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 a pain thing so that makes sense if if the healthiest communities are ones where they they kept that that community that mm -hmm. that uh, tr passed on you know, the knowledge and mm -hmm. and kept that same community yeah yeah i mean it's where i suppose really where someone is defining your self-worth or your own culture is defining your self-worth right and i think that there's a lot to be said for your own culture defining your self-worth but if your culture is broken if things have happened to your culture that cause that cause uh, uh a break in the information a break in the compassion and in the caring um well i don't know how we could expect a good result from that yeah yeah so so that's one thing that i've definitely seen you know when i look at certain communities where we've had as a european culture the least influence they're the healthiest hmm. communities that's fine that's really yeah. interesting so what would you say just to be like a sort of dev devil's advocate sort of thing like in whitehorse we have uh your the food bank and this group the uh, blood ties that focuses on harm reduction for people who are addicted and and have drug abuse problems they pro blood ties is a group that provides needles to be clean needles sterile things for them to use um groups like that and then the salvation army what do you say to people who are like you know if these things are just promoting further use of these things and by offering people food uh, for free, they're just not going to work for food and they're just going to like, and people, people, the blood ties giving people needles. Well, they're just promoting drug use. And if they, if, what do you think would happen if we got rid of the food bank tomorrow and got rid of blood ties and the Salvation Army? What do you think this community of people that these groups are helping, how do you think they would respond? Well, I, you know, I, <laughs> We, we we live in a caring society and, I, and to just say you're going to shut down those programs um really then where do they go i mean oh my goodness uh, i i'm a bit older than you but <laughs> yeah. one of the things that i liked about why i chose the food bank and why in a way i think the cho food bank chose me was that my mother who came from you know a very large family 13 children farming rural new brunswick um they didn't have a lot and there were times where my grandfather was without work for long periods of time um you know hunting if they couldn't get venison if they couldn't get moose meant that the family didn't have food period these sorts of things when you have large family groups like that and you have a, a caring society well my mother used to tell me people would come to the door who were hungry and my grandmother always had food for them there was always something on the stove well those days are gone from our society we don't mm. knock on our neighbor's door for a meal right uh, those days are gone this is this is our now this is our today and our today means that a caring society contributes so that a food bank can help take care of that so that on your behalf we can help feed your neighbor right uh when you talk about blood ties with harm reduction well they've been you know doing a needle exchange program for quite some time i have not gone and tried heroin because i could access needles <laughs> right, right. from blood ties i have not injected anything into my veins because i could go get needles at blood ties right so it's kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me when 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 you when people say <laughs> things like that the fact that you can obtain something doesn't mean you will act on something sure um you are you are doing something to resolve to make sure that there's not a future problem so that you can actually keep the amount of harm reduced and that's why they call it harm reduction right. um you know when you talk about um uh you know, AIDS and Hep C and these yeah. sorts of things. Well, if you haven't, you know, I mean, I lived through the 80s. I, I had many friends who had HIV who passed away. I lost almost my entire circle of friends. Now, they weren't drug users, but mm -hmm. we got to learn a lot about 
what happened in the drug use communities when that was happening in the 80s. Right. And when people couldn't get a needle, they shared a needle. Right. And guess what? Then we paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to try and heal, right. care for, facilitate an illness that could have been prevented. Right. That's like you said in the beginning, it's like that a cost effective way of dealing with dealing with it early instead of dealing with it later mm -hmm. when it's a way bigger problem. Absolutely. It escalates. Yeah. Way bigger problem. And, and it affects so many more people, their family members, the, you know, the ripple effect is, is just huge. Yeah. Um, and I also look at it this way too, is if I've got someone with, I'm dealing with, with addictions, you know, the fact that I give them some food and I help send them on their way with something in their stomach or some sort of compassion. Well, what better time that if they did change their life, would it be then when they're feeling a bit better about themselves? For sure. People tend not to want to take action in their lives when they're feeling miserable. That's right. Yeah. Because it doesn't get out of there. So if we can change that, there might be that snap where yeah. suddenly, you know what? I feel better. I'm going to take care of myself. And I see it all the time. I see people here on a regular basis who are in recovery and every now and then they slip, but their goal stays on recovery. And, and, and I see them on a regular basis. And, um, I would, I would be lying if I didn't say that I favored them, um, that I do things for them a little over and above because, uh, because well, they're working hard. So why can't I work a little right. hard for them too? They're struggling. You know? with, yeah. Sure. I think that is, uh, it does help that I think a lot of it comes down to community too. Like knowing that you have a community around you that will help you and, and give you support can really help people like addicts. You know, I think a lot of people become addicted because they're missing maybe some kind of family connection or some kind of community connection and they feel maybe alone or have that sort of weird void they're trying to fill and then by reaching out to these kind of people that's how they're going to be helped that's how they're going to get through addiction that's that's my belief is that it comes down to community support loving caring people around them to help yeah. push them through you know yeah no one's good no one's going to change their life when they feel like crap yeah they're just gonna their <laughs> life will get worse yeah. You know, um, when they maybe that time that they're feeling kind of good, they've had something to eat and they think about that last time that that whatever they took, whatever they drank didn't feel so good. Maybe they would turn around and maybe it would last months and then maybe they might relapse. But then do they set their sights back on being healthy again? You know, don't right. don't stop trying. Yeah, they've got um, you will not be defined by your last, your last episode, you know? Yeah. Um, if I was defined by all my bad days, well, I would never have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's for me. I like, I've dealt with forms of addiction in my life. And for me, when I go back into those, those habits or routines, those addictive tendencies, it's when I'm feeling shitty about myself, mm -hmm. when I'm not feeling very good. Sure. When I'm, yeah. And then sort of, it slowly like snowballs from a small anxiety to depression to addictive tendencies and, mm -hmm. and and things like that. We didn't invent as Europeans thousands of years ago alcohol because it was um, something that was going to be beneficial for us. <laughs> <laughs> we invented it because it made us feel good and escape uh, that really rough day where, you know, people would work hard and um, and live hard. And, uh, and then sometimes at night they would... Um, do something to make themselves feel better. <laughs> right. Whether yeah, it was it fermented to, yeah. and yeah, sure. That absolutely is what it feels down to. What we have in our society now is people who need to do that all the time. Yeah. It's just and levels, right? Different it's levels. levels. Absolutely. You know? And so, and you mentioned earlier that you, in your, you had seen it in your family and through others, just mm -hmm. uh, addiction and you, you've been around it. This is growing up in the North, as we mentioned, alcoholism up here mm -hmm. is very widespread mm -hmm. and it's just something especially living in the, and not just up here, I mean, in most of Canada and probably most of the world, you're going to run into people with these issues, you know, mm -hmm. people that it's, it's, it's not uncommon these days to just be related to someone or have a good friend or, you know, it's, it's a major issue at the moment, this yes. ad addiction. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, I mean, and it's also what, what does addiction mean to someone, right? You, we here in Whitehorse, we might drive by the liquor store and we might see a group of people out there that we know have a problem. 
But those are people that have no support mechanisms. And then there's the people who can live life, who happen to have money, uh, who happen to have family right. support, who really stay sheltered from that type of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, community scorn or community uh, judgment. Uh, right. And yeah. so because they don't face judgment, they may view themselves as better than those people. Yeah, they're functioning course, somehow. Yeah, so, exactly. You know. So, so well you know i may do that but i'm not as bad as that right so and, you know, depending on the yeah. what the substance is there's different stigmas too like if someone's i mean you can get addicted to sugar and you know that's kind of accepted that's fine you know or you can get be even if you're like an alcoholic you might view it differently than someone who's like a heroin addict just mm -hmm. because oh alcohol is legal so you know it's fine there's lots of people who drink everyone drinks i just happen to have a drink every single day and get drunk all the time but you know i'm way better than the person doing heroin that's mm -hmm. you know totally different right yeah well and yeah and of course there are it's all about different drugs right you know here in canada and in the u.s the discussion has been about marijuana and its legalization and um you know comedians have said it but i mean it's all obvious because we know for a fact that uh, no one ever, I've never had a fight break out here in the food bank <laughs> where they've maybe smoked a joint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Usually it's alcohol or some sort of hallucinogenic type of drug that um, they really aren't um, in control of their mind. Um, hallucinogenic. You know. Hallucinogenic, like I say that whether you know it's maybe a a cocaine or um, oh, methamphetamine or gotcha, uh, gotcha. those sorts of things, which are a chemical altering type of yeah um, drug. And a lot of them, like those ones, are very like speedy, sort of yeah. high energy. Yeah, we can spot them a mile away when they come in here. <laughs> oh yeah, you can yeah, see yeah. That they're behavior. very, very fast, very you know hyper. Um, usually they want Gatorade. <laughs> right, right. That makes sense. <laughs> you yeah. know, so fine, take the Gatorade. <laughs> right, and so you just mentioned um, marijuana. I mean, do you have an opinion on um, the, 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 a lot of these substances being illegal and? Well, like when you speak specifically about marijuana, I think that uh, we spend a lot of money and resources battling something that I think uh, doesn't need the attention that many of the other things do in our society. Right. You know, when you talk about mental health, when you talk about alcohol addiction, when you talk about some of the other types of drugs that are out there that we know um, aren't beneficial whatsoever mm -hmm. um, and that actually foster huge underground uh drug trades and criminal activity that goes far right. beyond uh you know uh, a bag of weed right so a lot of your perspective comes from like a sort of business perspective where it's like it, look it's just more cost effective to just like i, I think so too with, with something like marijuana if we could just regulate it it would, it would first of all be it would probably be cheaper i don't know maybe they would tax the crap out of it and it would be the same price or more for people but We'd also just, uh, in terms of money spent on putting people in prison, going through the justice system, oh, all huge. this, it would save our whole society, our whole community, a lot of money and probably end up making money because instead of the criminals or the, the drug dealers who are collecting the money from the, se the selling of this stuff, because the the war on drugs hasn't actually made it harder to get marijuana. It's marijuana is everywhere. It's easy to find marijuana. And so if we actually, if it was legal, I think that societies would be able to sell it in a regulated form and then the money would go back into the community instead of into the the criminal community mm -hmm. that is probably not putting their money back in it they're probably not even putting their money in banks they're probably you know yeah it's uh it's a whole business perspective yeah. I, 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 yeah i mean you can you can invest your money in one way to actually change things or to make things better or you can invest money in another way to make a whole bunch of people's lives more miserable if you look at the proportion of people in our prison system for really that shouldn't be there for that when you're talking about true mental health issues you're talking about right. those sorts of things but you know it's it's a population too that has a perception that um that uh yeah okay yeah maybe he's crazy but he should still pay for his crime well right. who's really paying yeah, for sure. <laughs> you are. You are Mr. Taxpayer. You yeah, know, that's, that's right. Really it's not bad. cheap to have people in prison. No, it isn't. And that's all taxpayers. And, and that it doesn't change them. 
it doesn't change, it doesn't deal with the mental health issues that no. are under all that or whatever's going on from their past that caused them to be there. And I do look at the disproportionate amount of First Nation people, Aboriginal people who are in our prison system mm -hmm. uh, compared to the main population. Right. I don't think that that means that we have less criminals within the non-Aboriginal population. No. But they Does certainly it... have more position and ability to deal with the legal right. system. Sure. And it just points to uh, like a greater issue that's going on, whatever it is. It's very complicated, obviously, but it comes down to more than just the drugs being bad or mm -hmm. something, you know, there's a, there's a, if there's a huge population of people that are being criminalized, there's a bigger reason, you know, there's, there's something else going on that we should address. But um, yeah, I think that's about covers it. I think so too. Now, um, one of the things too is that when we sort of talk about activities here at the food bank where we are, and we're located, you know, close to the Salvation Army and we're a block away from blood ties. I mean, when I come to work in the morning, I see the evidence of what happens. Mm. You know, there are times right. where outside the building, I'll see syringes, I'll see things, uh, empty alcohol containers, um, and that sort of is. So right. regardless of what I see coming in, I know what I can see, you know, like when we talk to our clients, I can also see the evidence right there on the street. So, right. But it's there. It's, it's there. <laughs> it's there. It's part of it. So, you know, we can pretend it's not, but I think that uh, we're not doing ourselves any favors when I mean, we do. And um, if people wanted to help, donate more to the food bank or mm -hmm. help help volunteer how can they get in touch and right on our website whitehorsefoodbank.ca uh, or give us a call at 867-393-2265 uh, but the website will pretty much take you anywhere you want to go all right well thanks a lot for talking to me steve you're welcome appreciate it yeah all right that's it thanks for listening as steven said if you want to find out more about the work he's doing here you can check out his website at whitehorsefoodbank.ca and for more of my work, check out changetruth.com.